and every Sunday. Grace and peace to you, my friends. I am Richard D. Johnson, a THM student at the Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, USA. This is EMIF TV, a very strong television program for Christians all around the world. There are two guiding principles, two emerging truths that guide this particular television program. They are to plant the seed of hope in the lives of the hopeless and to encourage Christians to live independently in Christ. I am thrilled by the second guiding principle to encourage Christians to live independently in Christ. In this 21st century, it is very significant that every Christian will have an understanding of God on how to be able to live not just a successful life but a faithful life in God. So therefore my friends who are out there, if you want to be able to live a successful but faithful life in Christ, I invite you to Image TV. Come, because there will be hope for the hopeless. Amen. Hello, hi there. This is Imev TV. I encourage you to watch Imev TV this and every Saturday. And I promise you, your life will not be the same. Imev TV, touching lives where necessary. Imav TV, um, I encourage you to keep watching Imav TV. We are here to plant seeds of hope for the hopeless and encourage men and women to live independently for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Welcome back to MF TV. We are glad you joined us today. Today we have a very wonderful, a wonderful subject with a wonderful man of God to explain it to us today. I am glad you came. I remember our own motive on this television is to bring God to you and for you to understand God for who he is and know Christ for yourself. So today, to do this discussion on the subject of why bad things happen to good people, I have with me Dr. Braid. He's going to introduce himself and tell us a little more about him and then we will go into the discussion. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me here. It's really fun to be here. Uh, so my name is Brennan Breed, and I teach uh, Old Testament here at Columbia Theological Seminary. Um, I've been here for about eight years now. Uh, I graduated from Emory University just up the road, also in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and uh, before that, I was at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, I got to study with some great professors um, like Carol Newsom and Chun Liang Xiao, uh, to whom I'm greatly indebted. And I work with some great folks here, uh, Christine Yoder and Bill Brown in the Old Testament department. Uh, and I also happen to work at uh, First uh, Presbyterian Church um, in Marietta, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. On Sundays, I teach a class. I'm a theologian in residence there, which is kind of a big name for the idea that I teach a class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so welcome. We really appreciate you coming here today. Our subject, you know, it's, it's broad, but I know you have a way of making us understand it better about why bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. why, why is it so? This is a great question, and it's a question that people have wrestled with since uh, the earliest writings that we have access to. That is to say, uh, the, the ancient Sumerians and the ancient Egyptians were people who invented writing, and some of the earliest things that they start to ask are questions like, why do bad things happen? So that is that this has been uh, a question that, that humans have grappled with since the dawn of time. And so the fact that we're grappling with it now uh, is part of our humanity, I think. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the, the most important uh, way to think about this for me is biblically. That is, I am a biblical scholar. Other people, uh, pastoral theologians, systematic theologians, um, Christian educators may have different ways of approaching this question, and they might have different resources that they draw from to create their answers. Uh, for me, I tend to look at the Bible as uh, the, the lens through which um, I begin to formulate my answers to questions that are really tricky like this. And one of the things that's really important about this question of evil in the Bible, or the question of why do bad things happen to good people, why, why do bad things happen to me, um, uh, there, there are a number of different responses in the Bible, uh, not all of which seem to apply to every situation. So one of my favorite passages in the Bible, um, I'm a, uh, I tend to work in wisdom literature, that is the books of uh, Job and Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. Uh, and one of uh, my, I mean, it's a, it's a, a, tricky, um, uh, a tricky 
type of literature, in part because they try to reflect on big questions, questions like evil. So Proverbs 26 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Uh, it is, uh, uh, the, the first half of the chapter really asks the question, how do we understand things? Uh, and how do we use, even how do we use scripture is a big question of this chapter. And of course they use Proverbs to get at this, uh, at this question. And one of the craziest things in the Bible is Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. So the first part of this says, do not answer fools according to their folly, or you will be a fool yourself. Okay, so don't, don't respond to foolish talk. We've all seen this, right? Someone types something foolish on the internet. Don't respond. You'll be typing foolish things on the internet all day, right? So, but then the next verse says, answer fools according to their folly, or they will be wise in their own eyes. So now we have to answer fools, or, yeah. or who, will, who will teach them, right? How will they learn if we don't help, help them learn? But these are verses right next to each other. One says, do not talk to fools, and one says, talk to fools, <laughs> right? This is, it seems almost silly. I don't think that the ancient authors of Proverbs were being silly. I, don't, I think that this is part of, a, 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 a part of a collection of Proverbs that says that uh, King Hezekiah's men put this part of Proverbs together in chapter 25. I think when people uh, put these, these Proverbs together uh, in a way that they were trying to say um, uh, neither of these Proverbs are useful in every situation. That is to say, we have to use our wisdom to apply these Proverbs. And uh, another verse from Proverbs 26 that I love is verse 9. Like a thorn bush brandished or waved around by the hand of a drunk person is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. And this is the book of Proverbs. Yes. So even scripture can be used wrongly, yeah. can be used in the wrong context, and it can hurt people, just like someone who's drunk waving around a thorn bush. So we need to be careful about how we apply scripture. So uh, there's a number of different, I think, uh, answers to that question, why do bad things happen to good people? And we get in trouble if we don't know the variety of them and also have the wisdom to reflect and apply them to different situations. So one, one answer to this would be uh, that people deserve it. Right? Like bad things happen to people because they've earned them. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you find in the Bible. Proverbs says this, right? The people who dig a pit, they fall into it. Mm -hmm. That is, if you try to do evil things, evil things come back on you. Yes. So th this is true. Mm -hmm. It's not always true. Uh, that is, it doesn't always happen the way yeah. you want it to, yes. right? But it can happen. That is to say, Proverbs gives you situations, um, uh, explains situations that might happen, and it gives you a proverb to explain it so that you have to see, does this explain the situation? I think in the end, people uh, will have to be accountable for the things they've done, but for now, often they aren't. Uh, there's another uh, a part of the Bible that, that predominantly uh, describes evil and suffering as a result uh, of people's um, sin and of them earning that, that suffering, and that's the prophets. Uh, so the book of Amos, let's say. I mean, Amos says, there will be evil coming, and you all have earned this evil. You've, you've created it or constructed it. Um, uh, another uh, part of the Bible, uh, so Pharaoh, Pharaoh does evil, he oppresses and enslaves people, and he profits off of it. And he ends up receiving, in a way, bad punished things. bad yeah. things from that, right? He, he kind of earns this as a way for God. God is going to free people who have been enslaved, and God will have to tear down structures in order to do it. Um, so that is to say, there are some times where people kind of earn this. Um, but that's what we often think, right, yeah. as Christians. This becomes our default way of thinking about evil. Uh, and Jesus himself has a problem with this, right? Yes. So in John chapter 9, mm -hmm. there's the man who's born blind. Yes, and the next. And what do people say about this man who's been Is born it blind? Because of the parents' sin? Yes. And so there's this idea that you can inherit your parents' sin. Now, this is in the Ten Commandments, right? God says, I will visit the sins of the parents on the children yes. for generations, mm -hmm. right? But then, of course, the people who love me and follow me. Now, I think this is often misunderstood that God is up in the sky throwing lightning bolts at the children of the people who have sinned. Yes. I think instead, what generational sin in the Old Testament uh, more accurately describes, um, when people create a bad situation, the children will suffer. Yeah. So Pharaoh makes a bad situation for the, the Hebrew slaves, and the children suffer. Or, uh, or let's say, uh, even, even Pharaoh's people suffer because they are dehumanizing their neighbors. They, they are all suffering uh, because of the situation that's been produced. Um, or uh, when, if people um, uh, abuse their children, their children grow up in an environment that, I don't think God did that, but the sins of the parents do pass along to children in many ways, if that makes sense. Yeah. So this is not always wrong, but in the case of the man born blind, the understanding is that this disability was a punishment and he er his parents earned it, yes. or he earned it, or yes. something. Who sinned? Yes. Him or his parents, right, yeah. is the real question. Who did the bad thing 
that is that has caused this. Yes, right? And so what does Jesus say? Well, he says, neither. Now, of course, they've all sinned. Mm -hmm. Everyone has sinned. But the question is the cause, right? Did they cause this man to be born unable to see? And I think what Jesus does here is he says that uh, uh, it it is sometimes true that people live in generational sin that they have caused. Uh, People sometimes live in generational sin that they've inherited. Sometimes people live, uh, in, in, you know, as Proverbs says, they've dug the pit they've fallen into, but not always. Mm-hmm. We need to look at the individual situations. Um, and Jesus tells us this man was not born blind. So, or was, was not born blind because of sin. Uh, so, in any event, that's, what, that's one response to that. Not always. Yeah. But there's other ways that the Bible gives us to think about this, too. Uh, sometimes um, uh, people end up thinking of uh, sufferings or obstacles that God has put them in our way to make us better people. Almost like a trial, mm-hmm. sort of the the sacrifice of Isaac is what some people point to and say. Well, God did that to so Abraham could grow up, or Abraham could prove his faith to himself and believe, or prove his faith to God. Um, uh, trials and tests do exist in the Bible, but again, we have to be careful about applying this, especially to ourselves or other people. So, in the book of uh, Genesis, John, uh, uh, we have the the. Um, uh, story of uh, Joseph, which ends the book of Genesis, mm-hmm. chapters 37 to 50. And in the story of, uh, of, jo- of Joseph, we have uh, a, a terrible thing that happens. He's uh, hurt by his brothers. He is cast into a well. He ends up being sold into slavery. Um, that, that he is uh, abandoned and abused and, and degraded by his brothers. And at the very end of that story, of course, in chapter 47, I mean, it, there's the revelation where uh, he reveals to his brothers that uh, who he is, that, and that he, he has saved them now. Yes. And he has saved all the people of Canaan and so on. And he says that God has put him, God, did, God, uh, God put me here. That is, he doesn't say that God put him in the well. If you read but it carefully. That, situation. that God used that situation for good. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily say that God hurt Joseph, yeah. but it says that God used Joseph's bad situation to be able to create good. This is true, and it's true sometimes, but not necessarily always. Right, right. So uh, and here I would come to the story of Job, um, which uh, I think is a very complicated story, and it's written in a way that is supposed to be confusing, I think. I think that Job is part of wisdom literature, just like Proverbs. And remember, we read Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5, which were confusing because they disagree with each other. But I think part of the way that wisdom literature, like Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes, is written is to try to get us to grow mentally and, uh, and in terms of our, our theological reflection, our thought. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's supposed to be like a puzzle. And I think that Job is the biggest puzzle in the Bible. It's very, it's very, very tricky. And I think that, it, that some of the trickiness of Job is even in the way that it's written. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I think Job, we often as Christians take the lesson of Job to be that we, um, uh, if you read just the beginning of Job, um, uh, that we are supposed to take these trials and be brave through them, mm-hmm. courageous. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, we're supposed to succeed with faith. And so we hear about the patience of Job. Mm-hmm. James even talks about the patience of Job. Job. But now, anyone who's read beyond chapter 3 of Job knows that Job is not always not easy. He's not, he's not the most... He's very patient, I should say. He's very patient for the first two chapters. And then he gets upset. Um, so that is to say that there's another dimension to the book of Job beyond just the fact that he is um, uh, uh, patient and, he, and he's a long-suffering and he uh, is courageous in the, in the face of suffering. Um, he does more than that. So sometimes I think we should be courageous in the face of suffering and, and withstand it with courage. Mm-hmm. But also there's other instances too. But I think the beginning of Job makes an even bigger question than this. This asks the question of the relationship between possessions and success and money and faith. And then suffering. Where does suffering go in that? Um, uh, So uh, a a student uh, who just graduated this last year, uh, Emmanuel Apompekpa, he wrote a uh, a big long paper about um, the, uh, the prosperity gospel and the book of Job. And uh, there's a number of different scholars, Chu Myung Seau and uh, Carol Newsom, my advisor and, uh, and mentor, um, who, uh, who have written about this, this question. And if you look at the very beginning of Job chapter 1, you'll see it's like a trap. It's written like a trap. Okay, so there was once a man in the land of Uts whose name was Job. Yes. So that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. This is uh, 
a better man than you, than, this is a, a better description of a person than we find anywhere else in the Old Testament. Yes. So David does evil, Moses does something wrong and God doesn't let him in the promised land, but Job is blameless, he's upright, he fears God and he turns away from evil, period, right? So this is, and then God says that later. So the narrator um, is quoted by God in uh, chapter one. So he's perfect, perfect life. And then this doesn't exist in the English translation, but in Hebrew, there's a little vav, this letter v. And what that means is and, but it can also mean but. Oh. It can also mean or. It can also mean therefore. It's a very tricky word. It's uh, every kind of uh, conjunction, every kind of co uh, connection of sentences can be uh, supposed by that word. So that man was perfect in chapter 1, verse 1, and then verse 2, and he had all these sons and daughters, and then verse 3, he had 3,000 sheep and so on. Verse 4, his sons would uh, go and hold their feasts in turn, so his life is pure harmony. His family is in unity. Uh, they love each other. They care for each other. He has perfect possessions, and he's the greatest man of the East and so on. And then verse 5, when feast days are run their course, Job would send and sanctify them. So this link between verses 1 and 2, Job was perfect and he had a perfect life. But does it mean he was perfect, but he had a perfect life? <laughs> that oh, is it, or, therefore. Or, therefore, exactly. Or is it just and? We, we're not supposed to know the difference. You know, so the whole book, I think, is exploring this connection between a perfect life and perfect possessions. But then for this very person, something happens. Yeah. That is, there's disaster that strikes. So, of course, Job's friends come, and Job's friends end up giving him arguments that a lot of Christians, we know the end of the book. The end of the book, God says the friends were wrong. Yes. Right. Yes. But we sometimes misread the friends, I think, because we know the ending. Yeah. So we think, oh, the friends are, 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 are they, they are really uh, not, not intelligent. They're very, uh, very dumb people. They, 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 <laughs> I hate the friends, right? Well, the friends are quoting Proverbs. They're quoting Deuteronomy. They're quoting the Psalms. They're quoting good theology. They're quoting Bible. The problem is, is that they're like Proverbs chapter 26, verse 9. They're like drunkards with the thorn bush waving around a proverb, right? They're misapplying these, this good scripture, yeah. right? So, uh, so what, what things do the friends say? What things do Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar say? Uh, 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 Eliphaz says, you must have sinned. You must have earned this. Uh, which, like I said, exists in the Bible, but not always. Yeah. And he says, you, you must have earned this sin. Bildad also says, you must have earned this sin. Zophar says, who are you to question God? How could you possibly ask questions of God, right? You can't know. Well, Job knows. You know, of course, sometimes we don't know, but sometimes we do. So the friends presume to speak for God. And also, you can see that the friends need to defend God. They imagine that they are the defenders of God. And that if Job is wrong, that they are the ones that need to make him right. And I think the book of Job asks us to take a step back and to say, does God need my defending? If someone says, God, there's a problem, do I need to say, no, there's no problem? No, I don't, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not honest. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so sometimes yeah. we need to say, tell me more. So friend, Job, what Job says is, please listen to me. Hear my story. My story is different from the stories you're imagining. Like in Job chapter 6, uh, he gets, tells his story of suffering in chapter 3, a big long poem, uh, and his friend Eliphaz in chapters 4 and 5 responds and says, uh, you must have sinned. Don't say that God has made a mistake. You must have sinned. Uh, in chapter 6, Job comes back and he says, um, he talks about taste. He says, your arguments taste wrong to me. And I think it's important that he uses the word taste because I can't tell you something tastes good to you. No. It has to be me. It has to be you, right? If I say, no, this, I, I can say this is good food, it's healthy food, it's cooked well, but I can't tell you it tastes good to you. That is to say, Job is saying, your arguments taste bad to me. I know that they're the Bible, but they're the wrong part of the Bible for me right now. And so Job says, listen to my words, listen to my life, listen to my experience. Use your wisdom, not just to throw Bible at me, but to carefully uh, uh, see which Proverbs need to be used right now. Okay. And in Job's, Job doesn't earn this, right? This is unearned suffering. So a lot of other Christians say, what's the real problem of Job? The Satan. Satan figure, right? In chapters 1 and 2. It's the devil. That is to say that Job is a book about God fighting Satan. Satan. And God wins. But there's a problem with this. There's a problem with this. If the whole book is about Satan fighting God, then why does the Satan character leave in chapter 2 and never come back? 
And at the end, of, Job and his friends don't talk about the Satan figure. And then at the end of the book, God explains something and doesn't mention evil. And evil isn't mentioned at the end of the book. That is to say, an evil character, the evil, uh, you know, a, a demon is not mentioned at the end of the book. So if the whole book is a struggle between God and Satan, then, then the point wasn't made. <laughs> the point wasn't made, that's right. So uh, I think there's a different way to think about suffering that the book of Job tells us. So if we turn the divine speeches, the speeches that God's, the God, uh, where, where God addresses Job. We have about Job. five minutes. Oh, okay. Great. I got, I got about five minutes left. Okay, great. So chapter, so chapter 38, uh, uh, where God answers Job from a whirlwind. And a whirlwind, you know, a big storm, something that seems to come kind of chaotically. Um, something that, that a lot, makes us, a lot of us question whether or not God is active in the world. God comes in a wind, uh, a, a storm. Um, and God, uh, you know, gets a little bit upset with Job. Um, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding and so on. But then God starts to talk about the creation of the world. And God says that, uh, the, God doesn't answer Job's question to say, here's look, number one reason why it's bad things happen to you, number two reason why bad things happen, number three reason. Instead, God says, I created the world. And when I created the world, God said in verse eight, God says, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? And here God is imaged as a mother, a divine mother, mm -hmm. giving birth to the whole universe, and that the sea comes out. And that God doesn't just give birth to the sea, but God shuts it in with doors, makes thick clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band. I think it's important here to know that the sea or the ocean is often a sign of a symbol of chaos. Yeah in the ancient Near East and in Israel. That is Leviathan in Psalm 70, is you know, swimming around in the chaotic waters, right? So there's these uh, chaos monsters in creation. This is, uh, uh, many neighbors of ancient Israel talked about chaos monsters living in a sea as part of their creation stories. It's not in Genesis 1, and it's not in Genesis 2. You know, it's, not, it's not in the book of Genesis, this idea that there was a chaos monster that God had to fight at the beginning of time. Their neighbors, the Babylonians, do have chaos monsters that the gods have to fight in their creation stories. So God here says, there, in a way, there was the sea, the symbol of chaos. That did exist when I created the world, mm -hmm. but I didn't fight it. I built it a playpen. So God gives birth to the sea, this chaos, uh, symbol of chaos, and then God makes the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. God wraps it like a baby and cares for chaos. And then God says, God prescribes bounds for it, bars and doors, like a little playpen, and God says, thus far you shall come and no further, and here your proud waves shall be stopped. I think this is profound. Uh, God is not saying, I will do away with chaos. God is also not saying that um, I will let chaos reign. That is to say, unpredictable events. Yes. Instead, God says, I have made this world with chaos inside it, but bounded. And I think this is really crucial for us as Christians because um, it, it's a way of God saying, I, did God create evil? Did God send, uh, create all suffering and send all suffering to people? To like, us. Yes, to us, you know, as a teaching tool or, or to, to punish us and so on. And I think what Job is saying is no, not all the time. Sometimes God does punish. Sometimes God tries to teach uh, uh, by, by suffering. Sometimes God sets people free by creating suffering for the elite, like Pharaoh. Pharaoh suffers because God is creating uh, justice and, and, uh, uh, on, on earth. But I think here this is another uh, slightly different way of saying there are events in this world sometimes where it's just chaos. Yeah. God does not force it to happen, but it's, it's something, it happens in the world within bounds. And as God has prescribed limits to it. And in a way, I think this whole story is about how, uh, and the rest of God's divine speeches are about, and at the end, Leviathan and Behemoth, these are kind of like chaos monsters in the Bible. So these chaos monsters exist precisely because uh, if there is going to be something like an ostrich in the world, which God describes in, in the book of Job, in these divine speeches, this bizarre ostrich, um, then I think that uh, uh, the, these strange creatures are signs that there is something um, uh, about l when life uh, emerges and newness emerges on earth, there also has to be death. Yeah. And there has to be some destruction. Yeah. And there has to be some space. If, we are going to, if humans are going to have even a bit of free will and a bit of the ability to create new things, some things have to be able to fall away. And maybe it's not always God destroying them. Doing yeah. it, yes. That is, um, uh, uh, God doesn't always kill everyone. Some people die of natural causes. But there is a way to think that um, if there is going to be space for a new generation to do new things, the old generation has to have space, make space for the new generation. 
And so there is a, a, a cycle to life that God has created and ordained. And within that, there is some wiggle room for newness so that humans can do things. And that also means the exact same wiggle room means that there can be hurricanes or tornadoes mm -hmm. or, uh, or suffering in my life that God didn't uh, uh, preordain and that I didn't deserve, but that it exists. Okay. Does that make sense yeah. or is that, yeah? Yeah, it is. Yes, that's where we want to get to. Yeah. That people would understand. Yeah. And it's, it's not always, but yeah. yeah but sometimes. Beloved, the peace of the Lord be with you. My name is Alfred Apia, a first year master of divinity students of the Columbia Theological Seminary, Atlanta in the US. This is a wonderful day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to specially invite you to follow us and watch us on Facebook Live, E M A C B, E M A B C B C B. You search it, and you, you, there are lots of things that you will, you will enjoy. There are so many things that you are going to enjoy, and they are going to change your life. I don't know whatever you are going through. I don't know whatever is your struggles. I don't know your challenges in life, but I want to encourage you that this and every Saturday. Follow us on eBay TV on Facebook and you will be blessed. We will bring or we have a lot of seasoned students who are theologically inclined who we will bring on board to come and discuss theological, social, economic and some physical issues that confront us in our daily life. And I know you will be blessed. Please stay in touch and God give you a shout Imaf TV. Um, I encourage you to keep watching Imaf TV. We are here to plant seeds of hope for the hopeless and encourage men and women to live independently for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Back. I think what you're saying really like is teaching us a lot, but like we said earlier, mm -hmm. Christianity has been preached to us such that um, we think when you're a Christian, you cannot have pain or suffering, anything that happens to you is the devil who caused it. Yeah. Or it's because you've sinned, or your mother's sin, your father's sin, your great grandparents mm -hmm. sin. So we, uh, we have this mentality that when all is not well, then our Christianity is not right. right. We kind of at a place where when something bad happens to you, even the pastors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, did this person do something wrong? Yeah. Maybe you go have a kid, baby, and the baby dies, yes. and everybody's misquoting the Bible, like you said, right. thinking that it's the sin of the mother or the father that caused that, mm -hmm. because without that, that cannot happen. Right. Maybe when somebody contracts a disease, we quickly assume it's a result of their evil doing, yeah. which we are beginning to understand from what you're saying mm -hmm. that it's not really so. Mm -hmm. There's more to life than this. That's what I, I think. There's right. really more to life than right. this. Right. Yeah. And sometimes that's true, uh, but, but often it's not. And so it takes our wisdom and sometimes our communal wisdom and hearing the voice of the person who is suffering. And that's what the book of Job tells us. Yeah. You have to listen carefully to the story and the individual experience of the suffering person and ask, them why they think it's happening and take that into account too. And I think like a lot of people suffer in the Bible who who didn't deserve it. I mean, Jesus is the best example, but also when Jesus tells his disciples, take up your cross and, and follow me, the early disciples, many of them died, be, not because of sin, but because they preached the gospel. That is the gospel Jesus says sometimes brings sufferings upon us because other people don't want to hear it or don't want to embrace it or it threatens them, threatens their money, it threatens their power and so on. So all to say that the gospel sometimes um, uh, uh, creates suffering for the person who bears it. Um, not always, but sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but I also think that this message of Jesus um, uh, taking away all your pain, all your sufferings forever, we all know that when we accept Christ into our hearts, there's, there is a, a, a freeness, a, a liberation, um, a, a, a cascade of love, and we often feel really good. But we all know that this doesn't last forever. Yes. In, in a way, I think when Christians try to um, uh, say that Jesus is the answer to all of your sufferings and you will never have them again, I think that's making Jesus sound like drugs. Like this is what people, this is why people do drugs, like heroin or something. They do these things because it takes away their pain and it does for a little while. And they go get more. But then they go get more and then they, and then their life falls apart, right? So it ends up hurting them. That is to say, I think we need to be careful to make, not, not sell Jesus like a drug. 
to take away all pain. That is that Jesus will help our, our lives grow and mature and develop, uh, but sometimes that also causes suffering for us to grow and change and develop. Mm -hmm. So all to say, I think that um, uh, having a, um, a number of different reasons available for why bad things are happening to us um, will enrich our lives, but also help us to be more gracious to ourselves and to our neighbors. Okay, so if somebody is asking, is God silent sometime when we need him the most? Yeah, God is silent for a lot of the book of Job, and Job says, answer me, answer me, answer me. Much of what Job says in the middle of the book of Job is, I wish I could talk to God. I want to talk to God. God, where are you? Please listen to me. And many famous saints throughout Christian history have talked about the dark night of the soul. That is to say, a, a time when their, their, their life felt like it was illuminated by the light of the gospel and by God's presence. And then everyone goes through a phase where they don't feel that anymore. So uh, one famous Saint Mother Teresa, she said for many years she felt like she didn't hear from God while she was serving in Calcutta and in India, the poor. Why didn't Mother Teresa hear from God? Well, we don't know. Yeah. God doesn't tell us. Yeah. But this is often something. So if you at home are feeling like God has abandoned you, God has left you behind, uh, God isn't speaking to you, uh, bad things are happening to you, and God is not there to rescue you, you should know that this has happened not just to a few Christians or a few followers of God, but this is a very common story throughout the Bible. Uh, the Psalms. Most of the Psalms are people suffering and crying out to God and saying, where are you? Show up and help me. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 13, a lament Psalm, where the person says, how long do I have to wait here for you? Which is a very rude thing to say to God. And yet the psalmist is, is telling us, giving us almost like a script to say to God, because it, we can be rude to God. We can ask, how long do I have to wait here for you? God wants us to be able to relate to God um, uh, personally and individually and with passion and emotion, uh, even if we're upset, I think. Um, so all to say that, uh, that I think that um, uh, if you are uh, feeling alone and abandoned by God, Job was there with you and Job was a righteous person. Um, Jesus was there with you on the cross, and Jesus was a righteous person. That is to say, people feel pain and suffering uh, sometimes because they're following God, and that might be you too. Thank you very much. Oh, such an interesting discussion. I've learned a lot today. I'm looking at you like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I've learned a lot today. Really Thank good. you very much for this. Well, I, I know it's going to get to people, and we need this in times like this because there's a lot of suffering going on, unbalanced things going on, mm -hmm. and people are asking God, how long? Are you really there? Yes. But now today we've heard a lot about this, and we know God is there. He sees each tear that drops, and he said he will listen. He will come. When the time is right. When the time is so right. So believe it. Mm -hmm. And he surely come when the time is right. So thank you very much. Thank you. Doctor, for coming. We really appreciate you. Well, and I hope you. God will use this to change the lives of a lot of people. Thank you once again, viewers. And we hope you have been blessed today. Don't leave us. Come back. We'll have more of this for you. And your soul will be enriched. And your faith will be strong in God. We thank you. And once again, this is MFTV. Bye-bye. We'll see you again same time next week. Bye. Hello. Hi there. This is Imev TV. I encourage you to watch Imev TV this and every Saturday. And I promise you, your life will not be the same. Imev TV. Touching lives where necessary.